Ladies and gentlemen, we're pleased to have you in the closing session of this symposium. As we begin, we understand that the translation is now active. We hope you will take advantage of that, uh, those who need it. Thank you. At this closing session, we have some items of business to go through. And first, uh, I, I should introduce myself. My name is Gary Doxey. I am a, an associate director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies here at the Law School of BYU. We have just a few items uh, of announcement to go over. We want to begin with the best, which is special thank yous. We first want to acknowledge all of our many student volunteers, about 70 of them, who have helped put this... 100. I have been corrected. It's 100 student volunteers. These are amazing law school students who have donated of their time over many weeks preparing for this event, and especially uh, an executive committee of around 15 of them have really invested a significant portion of their time during the summer in this last spring as well as now. So we're so grateful for them. We couldn't do it without them. The organizing committee, and I want to make special reference to Professor Elizabeth Clark, she has overseen everything, including the students. We're grateful to Elizabeth if, if she's here. We also want to give special thanks to Deborah Wright. Many of you have met Deborah Wright through emails as she helped arrange travel and other accommodations. Thank you to Deborah. We're, we're grateful for the entire team at the center, including Don Liu and Bob and others. We're, we're, they're too numerous to mention, and we'll leave some of them out if we begin to mention them, but we're thankful to them as well. Uh, I want to pay special tribute to a group of people that you may have met during the course of your time here as you've been visiting with us. We have a council or a committee called the International Advisory Council. This is a group of very dedicated citizens, that is, of citizens of the world. They're not all citizens of this country, some are from other countries. And they have contributed their time and their financial means to make this conference, as, as well as many of the other activities of our center possible. Those who come from academic institutions know that money is hard to come by in, at universities, but these individuals have contributed so that all of us could be here together. And besides which, they're just fantastic friends and hosts, and I hope that you've had an opportunity to meet them. If any of that group, the hosts or the, or the uh, IAC, the International Advisory Council members are here, would you please stand and be acknowledged? In many ways, they're the true hosts. We are their guests because of their generosity. We um, now, uh, before we move on, let me, let me just let you know that as this, after this session concludes, we ask you to make your way to the hotel in the normal fashion as quickly as you can or directly as you can because we want you to be prepared for a wonderful dinner and entertainment this evening. It will be on the first floor, the ground floor of the hotel, at 5.30 is when we are trying to gather. Uh, we'll have some important announcements at that meeting for you with reference to your luggage and to your travel. So you don't want to miss it. I hope you're hungry enough to want to eat it, but I hope you also want to go because, uh, because of the entertainment and the association with each other, but you'll also get some special announcements at that time. So 
don't miss those. One of the announcements I'll just share now, that is that um, tomorrow morning by 7.30 a.m., you need to be checked out of the hotel. Not simply packed, but actually checked out at the front desk by 7.30 in the morning and the buses will depart at 7.45. You won't have a chance to go back to the hotel to check out after our activities tomorrow. So you will be leaving the hotel permanently at, at uh, 7.45. Now, finally, the last item of business. You'll, you have found at your seats a survey. This survey is extremely helpful to us to help us improve what we're doing and give us feedback. It has two pages. The first page has a number of questions. The second page is for you to keep. You can write down on the second page some notes of what you hope to take home with you, what you plan to do as you've learned from each other about uh, the importance of religious liberty and about comparing one another's experience. This, this second page is for you to keep. But the first page, if you would, we're going to, for the sake of interpretation, I'm going to read through each question. I think probably most of you have started already, but just in case you didn't get it and you're listening uh, to interpretation, let me read through it. The categories across the top are on the, le the, the first one is on the left-hand side is excellent, then good, fair, and poor. So if you would just check off one of those, here are the categories. Transportation. Going down the page, the second is hotel. Hosting. Meals. The experience in the mountains at dinner on Saturday, Sundance or Zermatt. The humanitarian center, which you haven't seen yet, so you, I don't know how you would fill that out. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, interpretation, the language interpretation is next. Conference facilities and the conference theme or content. Do I need to do that again? I think we've probably got it. Okay, then the questions. There are five questions. The first is, Comments on any of the above or general impressions of the symposium. The second one is, what comments do you have about the symposium theme, panels, and sessions? The third is, which activities were most meaningful to you? Question number four, what is the most important insight you gained from your particip participation in the conference or the symposium? Question number five, do you plan to take any specific actions as a result of what you have heard? If so, what? Again, we appreciate your kindness in filling these out. We learn from our mistakes, if you need to point out some mistakes. We appreciate any constructive comment you can make. We'll collect these forms uh, as you leave. In fact, if you wanted, you could leave them at your place and we can pick them up or you could turn them into one of the students. Well, in this final session, we want to call upon a few of you. We can't have all of you, but you're, we have so many distinguished guests here. But we thought we'd call on just a, a, a random few distinguished guests um, to share some impressions and thoughts they may have had about their experience here, what they might have learned, and any impressions they, they may wish to share. First, I want to just check, we, we asked one and then I think we gave him the wrong instructions and I just want to make certain he isn't here. Is uh, Julio Mendes here? Julio Mendes is not here. We, would call, we, will call the, we will call on Alfonso Santiago from Argentina 
the Director of School Policy, Government, and International Relations at Austral University to come forward and take a, a, a seat here. On, and we would also like to ask Michael Quinlan from Australia, who is the Dean of the School of Law in Sydney at the University of Notre Dame in Australia. We ask also to come forward Elisabetta Kitanovic from Serbia, who is an important officer in the Conference of European Churches, now currently working in Belgium. We'll begin with these three, and I'll stand up in a few minutes, and we'll ask for some more. Let's just begin in the order that, uh, as we called them. Yes. Perhaps maybe with comments if you come to the Yes. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hear from you today. I have reflected so much according to the different topics that they have been more likely some kind of a triggers for me. If I were to say what is the personal balance in in where I'm finishing this symposium is the following. I have identified in the Latin America area which ones are the principal topics regarding freedom of religion that today are some of the things that we need to pay attention to. And freedom of religion has a lot of topics to talk about, but in every time, in every moment, it defines some priorities in the agenda. And if I were to say which ones those points are regarding to the freedom of religion in Latin America nowadays, I would say it would be the following. The threats that we should have, the threats that people and religions might have regarding a series of guidelines regarding to health, to abortion, or perhaps to other contents regarding education, like uh, sexual education, or topics referring to laws that are national and international when it comes to discrimination. I think that there are three areas, medical topics, education topics, and non-discriminatory topics, which are the ones that causes threat to the personal cushions to the institutions in our countries. Therefore, we have to work especially, we have to work especially, we have to work the contents and the, fu and the fundamentals when it comes to the objection in person and also with the objection to the conscience in order to keep fulfilling our activities and contributions to society without seeing ourselves obligated to adopt different measures or do things that they go against our, our commission. I think that these particular topics and it and talking in a strategic way, they are fundamental when we are about to face all these challenges in our continent. Thank you. Well, thanks again to BYU Law, Cole Durham, and all involved in this wonderful event. I just wanted to pick out five highlights, personal highlights of mine of the conference. I think the first plenary session really did a great job at setting the scene for the whole of the conference. For me, uh, Monday morning session on interreligious cooperation, religious freedom and social stability which looked particularly at some of the fractured and encouraging relationships between Christians and Muslims with insights into the position in Nigeria, Australia and New Zealand uh, was, was a real highlight and actually an eye-opener for me because I unfortunately learned of a terrorist incident that had happened in Sydney uh, last Friday when I was here. So I hadn't actually heard about that, which involved uh, a shooting of uh, a member of the police force in, in Sydney. Um, on Monday afternoon, I really enjoyed the session on Canada 
and the discussion, which included discussion of the West, West, Trinity Western College case and the religious freedom position in Canada from Bar Barry Bussey, Palbinda Cow Shergill and Anna Sue. Another highlight for me was on Tuesday morning, the religion and social tension session with Rosalind Hackett, Recap Centurk and Cole Durham. It was a particularly helpful and a particular highlight of mine to hear an, an Islamic approach to religious freedom, which is not something I'd ever heard anything about before, and to hear from one of our hosts, Cole Durham. I found his discussion on the myth of religious violence particularly interesting, and I was really very pleased that, uh, I think at the last minute, he had to fill in for a speaker who couldn't be here, and he certainly did that with aplomb. Uh, then we moved to Tuesday morning, and it's hard to identify the highlight of highlights of an event like this, but I think uh, for me, the highlight of highlights was the discussion of interreligious cooperation in the Philippines and most particularly in Jordan between Christians and Muslims. Um, I think everyone who was able to attend that session left it enriched. Sometimes the violence in, in our contemporary world, and I mentioned a, a, an example of that a second ago, can fill us with despair. But this session was filled with joy, brotherhood, love, and hope. And I'm sure the experiences of Grand Mufti Albtush, Father Richard Baboa, and Father Nabil Haddad will be valuably shared in the countries of all who were able to be here and hear them speak, or have a chance to watch the video or hear, hear a recording of their presentation later. It really was a wonderful, uplifting moment. Thanks. Here are some of uh, my impressions. So first of, of all, I would like to congratulate to BYU for excellent organization of this symposium on law and religion, um, and especially to Professor Cole Darum for all uh, this organization. Uh, as we have heard um, during many sessions, freedom of religion or belief, it's very complex fundamental human right, and it has uh, links with freedom of expression, freedom of association, anti-discrimination legislation, etc. I must say I really admire to the political concept of this conference and to its technical organizations. So I very much enjoyed session on Canada where uh, Barry and um, Paul Binder uh, argued on the same case with the different uh, perspectives, very much opposite perspectives. And um, it was interesting for me that even after the session was over, they were very nicely and politely talking to one another. So <laughs> this is something that I really take uh, with me. Um, then a uh, session on uh, freedom of religion and belief and foreign policy also was uh, very interesting and inspiring. As I'm working in that field of foreign policy, I also must say that I learned a lot and a lot of things I take uh, with me. What I really appreciated is that as somebody who is working on Europe, uh, we gather here from all different continents and also I could see where is the place of Europe in the global world. And, um, uh, I appreciate it very much that this conference and symposium had interfaith and interreligious components. What I take with me is great friendship, uh, networking, and the smiles of the students. Thank you very much. Thank you for such wonderful comments. Our next speaker will be um, Julio Mendez, who is a presbyter doctor a professor at the university, the Catholic University of Salta in Argentina. After that, we would like to invite to come forward, um, we'd like to ask um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Dominican Republic, Mariano Germán Mejía, to come forward. And, and then we will hear from Faith de los Reyes from Indonesia who is the, a research and project coordinator for Human Rights Resource Center at the University of Indonesia. Yes, yeah, after. Yes, we, we may have to take turns in, in occupying the seats. Um, finally, we would like to have come forward, oh, not finally, 
Um, Kishan Manocha from Poland, a senior advisor on freedom of religion and, and belief for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And then we would be pleased to have with us Ahmed M. Ibrahim from Zimbabwe, the retired justice of the Supreme Court of Swaziland and the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe. We'll go in that order. Bien, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to express uh, uh, thanks uh, multiplied to all of those who organized, who have invited us, and uh, congratulations for uh, the efforts, for the efficiency, for the organization, for the human climate that you have accomplished, and also for uh, this uh, for the temperature, you know, the weather outside as well. And uh, I think the experience these days uh, has uh, revived uh, the conviction of the value of the joining and sharing and, and also the value of the religion. And this has been said and I have noted and many of the expositions, presentations, and conversations that we have had, the value that the religion has in society, and therefore, the idea that the religious freedom doesn't walk through the silence, through the hiding, through the making aside uh, the interior of the conscience or the house or only the temples of worship, but it's also necessary as they come up in this, the history that religion can have a public space and that we can all have it, that diversity also can be expressed. I believe that the appreciation that comes up, that searches from the knowledge, this vision uh, of uh, the unity of to value, appreciate, and recognize that religion is good, that religion is not a danger in society, and that everybody can offer our faith as a testimony to offer to God, never to impose, but neither to let to be imposed uh, by the atheism. And to finish, another idea that has been important that I think and that I have seen represented is the idea of the patience and the idea of to understand the processes and to recognize when we find a situation where there are other confessions and that has been better installed or positioned, that the path is not to take away and to impose to others, but to ask, to search, to reivindicate that all of us can have the same freedom in private as well as in public. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you, to all of you gentlemen and ladies. Uh, it seems to me that what it is most important, what, what is most important about the topics that could be chosen uh, of the religion and social stability, I think that it actually takes and it took its place in the world, I think one of the better and important positions in the world. In this event, that particular topic for me personally, it has strengthened the importance that the religion has and the right, and the right to all humankind, to all societies 
to all the countries, to all the religions, to all the juridistic systems. And to me, what it got my attention was the liberty that was in the particular election of the different people that are here with beliefs that were defined and non-defined and personalities with different positions. And how, and how from the different optics and point of view of the participants and how they tried everyone. Looking, looking it up from the point of cooperation, from the constitutional point of view from every country, from the Congress, from the religious dictatorships with systems, with dictatorship when religion comes about, systems with democracy, countries with secularism, others with worship, in how the different judicial systems are focused on the rest. And how, how one and other topic historically in different countries, they are legitimate. I have always said as an attorney that the history is a very important point to legitimize the institutions. And I'm taking with me the conviction that that's how it is. We have discovered in this event the different strengths and weaknesses in, of every country, the complexities of the beliefs in jur juridistic systems and the possibilities to resolve them. But finally, and I'm taking the conviction with me that man is never going to stop to the existence of every single thing. And that the best and the more convincing explanation that they could find is the one that it comes from a superior Almighty that it comes and pierces their soul. It doesn't matter what denomination, that's what I believe. It doesn't matter denominations. Why? Because even though that there are differences in the denominations, what, what this event helped me find was that the men nowadays and the beliefs they are seeking to come into an agreement to cooperate, to find harmony in every position, to forsake all the luxury and all the things that are go against that, to accept what's relative, to accept what's absolute, and to upset the material and also the non-material. And finally, the importance of what's not material. Why? Because we keep seeking and asking, we came to a day we will live and we will go someday. We need to have, of course, happiness and harmony in order to live and faith to keep following in a tomorrow. And that's the conviction that I'm taking. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hi, good afternoon. Um, the past three days, we um, heard from speakers many possible solutions and many ways of approaching the issue of freedom of religion and belief. And so with all these innovative and sound ideas, what Chief Justice Mogueng Mogueng, I hope I'm saying his name right, <laughs> said really resounds with me. He said that nations, countries, and peoples must ask themselves what it will take them to end situations that do not respect freedom of religion and belief. 
During the breakout sessions, I mostly attended those that touched on concerns from around Asia. And I really appreciated the opportunity to listen to the speakers coming from the governments on how they, they balance many priorities and interests, including freedom of religion and belief. I come from a nonprofit organization, and it is sometimes easy to be frustrated and to criticize how slow progress is made. Um, so listening specifically to representatives from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from the Philippines, on um, give their uh, wait, give me gave me an appreciation of how the region um, is facing the challenges that they are um, being faced with right now. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to the International Center for Law and Religion Studies for inviting me here. Aside from the lessons that I learned, the opportunity to meet such a wonderful group of experts and very warm people is really appreciated. And I look forward to seeing you and maybe in per even perhaps working with some of, some of you in the future. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. I um, just would like to share uh, three uh, main reflections uh, with you. Uh, two of them uh, relate to the substance of, of our discussions. And one, uh, the first point I'd like to make is about this experience. Um, it's been a pleasure, again, having been here for the second time, and a privilege to be part of an experience that I think is quite unique in the way it not only values knowledge and expertise and experience, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the conditions that are conducive uh, to the creation of an environment in which learning flourishes. Um, those attitudes and qualities, may I say, of the spirit as well as of the mind, uh, courtesy, respect, patience, a posture of learning, listening, uh, humility, and generosity of spirit, spirit. And these are not just qualities brought to the table by all the delegates, um, but by everyone involved in the organization and planning and running of this event, creating these conditions and the dynamics for fruitful and rich discourse. And it, we can only hope that this experience is something which can be replicated um, in wider society. Uh, I think the, uh, clearly this, this attitude of listening and learning um, is, is born of a, a recognition that we're dealing with um, complicated, complex, and controversial uh, matters to which there aren't any uh, ready-made formulae, magic formulae, or shortcuts, but rather principles to be identified and insights to be uh, grasped and ideas to be consolidated and linkages uh, to be made and most importantly questions to be posed. Turning to, to substance, uh, one central point I will take away and reflect on further, particularly in the context of the work that I do at the OSCE, is the explicit structural link between religious freedom uh, and greater uh, social stability, cohesion and well-being, um, and this event has uh, heightened my awareness of religion, religious freedom's strategic value, its potential uh, uh, to promote security and prosperity in its widest, in their widest sense, so that we do not just regard religious freedom as this nice-to-have human right, but as an issue at the very heart of serious policy making. And finally. Um, the need for a long-term perspective. Because as we look to the future, um, we would do well, I'm sure we do recognize this, to remember that the emergence of new issues and challenges is normal, is a normal phenomenon in ever-changing societies. And it should serve as a, as a welcome stimulus to clear thinking, to uh, clear analysis on the part of everyone and a recognition that we can only advance uh, freedom of original belief, religious freedom, if we uh, conduct this work consistently as a long-term priority over time. So thank you to 
everyone for making this a very meaningful, yet another meaningful experience. And I'm deeply grateful for being invited to be part of it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, my brothers and sisters, you the God-loving people that are gathered here this afternoon. I am going to pass an extemporary judgment on the events that have taken place during the course of these last few days. I will be brief and I will make it in point form. The Mormon people, the warmth of the people that we have experienced here has been heart-tugging and just an incredible experience and very touching, too. You are a good people, a great community, a valuable asset to humanity. Your young students are a great credit to the Mormon community. Well-behaved, disciplined, not loud, immensely helpful, yet full of life and always smiling. Four, who said that the Peace Corps only came into being through the political activities of JFK. You, the Mormon community, have been practicing Peace Corps activities since you came into being. Every year, your students, your elders, go out and serve outside America. That is Peace Corps activity. Your surroundings of Salt Lake City, Provo, Utah, a part of America which I hadn't visited. I had visited many parts of America. It's clean, it's beautiful. The surroundings are just mind-boggling. But most of all, the most significant thing that I will take away and my wife will take away is that you are such God-loving people. How could anyone have persecuted you as late as 1830s? It's just mind-boggling. Thank you. Thank you to each and every one for their lovely comments and kind statements to us. And we hope that you all have taken away more warm memories and much learning from this experience. As we finalize this great symposium, we are going to listen to two very distinguished scholars who are known worldwide. The first we will listen to is Professor Silvio Ferrari, from, who is at the University of Milan in Italy. He is a professor of canon law. More importantly, you should know that he is one of our oldest friends. Uh, he has helped us at our center in so many ways. He has been a lecturer at many universities. He's a distinguished figure in the international field of law and religion studies. He is the founder and uh, honorary, I believe the title is something like honorary perpetual president or something of the international, I should get that right, shouldn't I? Uh, the International Consortium for Law and Religion Studies, which is uh, an, an important organization worldwide that gathers together scholars of law and religion from all over the world. Uh, he will be with us. He's also, I should say, uh, the recipient of our Distinguished Service Award on a prior occasion. We are so grateful for his continued and fairly frequent 
cooperation with us. We'll be pleased to hear from him. After that, we'll hear from Professor W. Cole Durham, Jr., who is our founder and the director of, this, uh, of, of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. Cole also currently serves as the president of the international consortium that Silvio founded. And S Silvio, as the perpetual president for life, or whatever it might be, uh, the honorary, and Cole, it's good that they have a good relationship because they do so well together in that setting as well as this one. We uh, at BYU are honored to be associated with Cole. He's, I, I, I know he'll feel embarrassed if we go into it, but it was his vision and his perpetual work, his, his persistence, his daily schedule of, of working in this field so tirelessly around the world that has made this symposium and this center what it is today. You may wish to know that in addition to this symposium, we as a center participate in perhaps about 10 to 15 conferences a year in other parts of the world that we help organize. It's Cole's effort and Cole's vision that helps make that possible. In addition to that, he is a, a citizen of the world. I don't know what time zone he lives in. <laughs> he is, he is um, you didn't want to attend your own funeral, did you? <laughs> um, but we could go on and on. He is, uh, there was a time at which we were worried about his income tax status in the United States because he was outside the country more than he was in the country. <laughs> but it's not simply going to stay somewhere, but traveling constantly, maybe one night in one country, two nights in the next country, and so forth. And so it's with that vision, with that tireless effort that, that we are engaged in a great work to to build the field of law and religion studies around the world that we're all participating in here today. So without further ado, let me turn it over to them and, and express, again, gratitude to each of you for your attendance at this symposium. Thank you. Well, let, let me start by saying that I have always disliked to give conclusive remarks at a conference <laughs> because you are faced by an unfair dilemma. Either you prepare your speech beforehand and stick to it irrespective of what is said during the conference, or you listen to the speakers and you have no time to think and to prepare something sensible for your final speech. I have chosen this second avenue, so forgive me if my remarks may be a little rambling. Uh, to make things less bad, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation, mostly because I do not trust my English. So if you cannot understand my Italian English, you can at least read it. And finally, if you see me leaving the room a few minutes before five, please don't think I am rude. I was not strong enough to decline the invitation to give a class in this beautiful uh, university. So, let me start. I'm ready, if also the... Okay, we are here, beautiful. 
In their keynote speech, Gunnar Staltet and David Little defined the relation between religion, law, and stability, social stability, in the following terms. Social stability is about cohesion and integration. It is about welcoming the other in all his otherness as a brother and sister. For this to happen, religion and law are indispensable. And little, I have argued that human rights, religious freedom, and peace are positively related. These statements and the title itself of our conference can be read in two different ways. The first reading goes more or less this way. Law, religion, and social stability are a set of uncontested positive values. Religion more in particular. Religion provides the vision and moral strength. Law provides the structural framework. And social stability is the final outcome of this happy meeting of religion and law. Maybe it is a, bit, a little too uh, easy. And so there is also a second reading of the same title and the same statements that goes in this different way. Religion, law, and social stability are changing, disputed, and ambivalent notions. And uh, uh, our debates uh, privileged this second reading as uh, it is uh, shown by the questions that uh, were discussed during our sessions. For example, yesterday morning, is yoga a religion? Or what to do with religions that preach violence? And uh, you understand these questions uh, highlight how changing the notion of religion is and how ambivalent the impact of religion on society can be. But the same happened regarding law. Again, these are questions that came up during our discussions. Is law dispensation of justice or enforcement of legal rules? And can law be the wrong tool when reconciliation is needed? And finally, regarding social stability, uh, yesterday morning, uh, um, a question, more, more of a question, uh, a comment was, uh, is social stability an imperative? Is uh, social change so bad? And I was uh, struck by this uh, question because uh, it came to my mind that uh, sometimes uh, freedom of religion is uh, born out of a social instability. Uh, for example, if you think of uh, uh, the uh, ed Edict of Milan, uh, enacted by the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, and uh, the first proclamation of uh, religious freedom, uh, this uh, um, document was enacted exactly because the growing num number of Christians in the Roman Empire uh, had, uh, were threatening the social stability of the empire. And giving freedom of religion was a way to uh, restore 
a social stability that was endangered. So you see, freedom of religion can come out, not from social stability, but from a time of uh, social struggle, social instability. Now, this last question, is a social stability an imperative? Is a social change so bad? Uh, got an answer um, during our discussions. Uh, more than one speaker underlined that uh, some degree of uh, uh, social uh, change is essential to social stability. Now, who could disagree with this statement? However, uh, in my opinion, this statement leaves unanswered the real question. And the real question is, what makes meaningful change possible? Not ephemeral change, not epidermic change, not casual change, but uh, meaningful change. And by this expression, I mean a conscious effort to transform the social issue and structures in depth. Now, what makes this kind of uh, change possible? And my answer is only the existence of a plurality of life visions, experiences, experiments in civil society. Only the experience of different ways of living together. Only the different experiments in living that take place in social institutions like family, schools, hospitals, and so on. Only these things can generate meaningful change. Where this type of plurality of live visions, experiences, experiments does not exist, change is impossible and uh, social stability becomes oppressive. Think, for example, of uh, uh, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was, uh, for a long time, a, a pretty stable um, uh, country. But when its political structure collapsed, all of a sudden, it was a chaos and that there were no civil societies forces, no civil societies experiences uh, ready, ready to fill um, the gap left by the fall of communism, ready to propose alternative ways of structuring, of structuring society. So my first uh, conclusion, I call it uh, <clears throat> a counterintuitive conclusion, is only a plural society can be a stable society. While counterintuitive, because uh, social plurality, social diversity, requires a permanent negotiation between different claims, and the balance between them constantly shifts. So how can a plural society be a stable society at the same time? And here, the main point, in my opinion, is thinking of social stability not as a static condition, but as a dynamic process. Uh, this morning, somebody spoke of uh, diversity management. And I, and I, in a sense, would say that uh, social stability 
is a process of diversity management. Look, not at the outcome of the process, but at the process itself. Because the social stability is based on the interaction, on the ongoing, on the continuous interaction of three different social spaces. First, a space where different life visions and experiences can develop and flourish. We can call this space public space, or we can call it civil society, depending from the angle we are looking at this space. And I already described what I mean by this type of space. Then second, a space where these different life visions and experiences can dialogue, can interact, can meet each other. And this space is the space where solutions given to concrete problems can be compared. The solutions to the need, to the concrete need of peoples, of people, that each uh, community, each um, experience is able to create and is able to propose. And this is what we could call the public sphere. And finally, a space where on the basis of this dialogue, decisions are, take, are taken according to the democratic rules. This is the sphere of the institutions the institutional domain. But the decision taken by the institutional authorities, where are, on, on what ground are based? They can only be based on the ground provided by those uh, actors of a civil society that created experiences experiments that then can be um, uh, replicated at, at national or a higher uh, level. At this, uh, in this space, in this institutional space, uh, decisions are taken uh, according to the uh, democratic rules. That is, uh, the main principles is uh, the respect of uh, uh, the majority will, but a respect which is limited by another respect, the respect of human rights. Normally, in a democratic society, you take your decision voting. But you do not vote on everything, because there are some rights that are not decided by voting, because we recognize that these rights are, that every human being is entitled to enjoy these rights, and here the majority rule does not apply. At this point, speaking of religion and the freedom of religion is quite easy. It is quite easy because we have prepared the ground. Religions, and I'm speaking plurally, not religion, religions, are a central component of a plural society. There is not much to be discussed here. It's quite evident, I think. And the freedom of religion 
is the right, that grants religions, the possibility to play their role in society, the possibility to offer their contribution to what, um, in a, uh, Roman Catholic language, is the common good, uh, the building of a just and a cohesive uh, society. And uh, in my opinion, the beauty of this uh, point is that there is no need to claim that religion and freedom of religion are special, are unique, to give them a sound foundation in the social structure. Maybe they are special, maybe they are unique. I am not saying they are not. But in this discourse, in this setting, you don't need to make this claim, because religions and freedom of religion need to be respected simply because without them, social plurality would be weaker. Social plurality could not exist, which means, in my opinion, another thing. There is a solidarity between the right to freedom of religion and other rights, including equal treatment. Uh, the right to freedom of religion cannot exist outside of a larger context of rights that all together make plurality possible and effective. So, my conclusion is quite uh, simple. Religions can contribute to social stability, provided they accept social plurality through the recognition of freedom of religion. And uh, it seems to me that uh, um, the um, intervention and uh, the discussion at this conference have proved exactly this point. Thank you. Well, I think if nothing else, you will have as you've listened to people at this uh, conference, you'll have some sense of the, I want to say, the joy it is to work with, with some of these other uh, great figures that we've had uh, speaking here. Uh, I, I do want to join my own personal thanks to all the people, the students, our supporters, uh, and most of all to those of you who have come from far distant places. I do know a bit about what it's like to sit on an airplane for a long time, and so I have great sympathy for you. You should have sympathy for me, because I'm taller than most of you. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, things, this kind of event could not happen without the uh, coordination of many, many other people. Uh, I think one of the reasons it's so important to have events like this is just to be able to sort out uh, things that we differ about and things, that, but things that, where there are common uh, visions. One, one of my early experiences with Silvio Ferrari, he will probably remember this moment, uh, we were in Romania and uh, we had just had a conference, this was in the mid-90s, and Romania was at the stage of trying to enter the EU, and they had a, what we could best be called a super committee in their Senate, which had the power to do anything necessary to get into the EU. And uh, we had the opportunity of meeting with this committee at the end of the day after our conference. So imagine going from a session like this into a Senate committee. And we knew they had been meeting all day, and that they were tired, and we thought we would get about 15 minutes. 
and I'm not sure why I was sort of the leader of that delegation, but I ended up starting talking to them, and some of you from abroad can imagine this. Sort of their eyes started drooping. They were saying to themselves, American, irrelevant. Uh, and then, at that precise moment, uh, Silvio spoke up with his uh, eloquent English. I think you were speaking English and not French that day. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, no, it must have been English. Or I wouldn't have understood. But uh, <laughs> uh, he said, no, this is not just American. This is really critical. This is something that we all agree on. And, and I think that's one of the important things to uh, look for. Uh, we do come at things with different histories, different cultures, different backgrounds, but we, there are some common, deep fundamentals here, and it's important to be able to know when it's important to stand up uh, for, those, for those kinds of things. So I have a special kind of uh, thanks to some of the people that I've worked with in many countries, in many different places, uh, and I'm glad that many of the rest of you have been able to hear them this conference, uh, Silvio, uh, Tura Lindholm, uh, David Little, Gunnar Stolset, uh, Rosalind Hackett, and many others that I could pick out, but uh, I'll obviously miss some, but, but I hope you know that you're included in my appreciation. In his remarks Monday morning, Marco Ventura commented that this is a place where people passionate about religious freedom and law and religion feel at home. There are some reasons that we feel passionate here because we got here because we needed religious freedom and didn't have it in many other parts of the country. We were driven from New York to Ohio to Missouri to Illinois and finally Brigham Young chose this place in hopes that no one else would want to come here. <laughs> in that, he failed because two years later they discovered gold in California and this became a stopping off point. Uh, and it's now actually one of the most, uh, typically voted one of the most livable places in the country and so you've had a little, a bit of a sample of that. Uh, but we hope, uh, I, I remember another year we had uh, a person who had been really the father of the Bangladesh Constitution was here, and he talked about uh, sort of feeling at home, and, and I hope that you will have some sense of being welcomed into to our home, recognizing that it has its quirks and its differences, but uh, I remember one year we had someone who smuggled a coffee uh, thing in with, uh, <laughs> and shared it with some of her friends. Uh, we all have our own quirks. Uh, we've tried really hard on food this year. We finally thought we had a solution with uh, vegetarian for all, but we added milk products. <laughs> and it's, uh, we apologize for those for whom that didn't work. Uh, but, uh, you know, these are, these are things we live and learn and, and things, ways we come to love other people. I think many important things have been said here. My impression is that we have had many thoughtful and outstanding uh, presentations. But I hope in particular that you will be, have us go away with the sense of our uh, sincerity and hoping that if there are opportunities to support you and your work, uh, that. Uh, within the limits of human finitude, uh, we will try. Now, we understand that freedom of religion or belief is understood differently in different ways by different people, uh, and sometimes the differences can be sharp. My own view is that we need to do what we can to find appropriate fora for formulating our understanding of the complex issues of freedom of religion or belief. Uh, the issues are complex. Uh, they are uh, much more, they depend, demand much more than a sound bite. I have a friend in the Mormon Public Affairs Department who would really like me to learn how to speak in sound bites, and I've told him that's his job. Uh, I'm a law professor. Uh, so I speak in long lines with footnotes usually, uh, but uh, 
but, but I, I have a deep belief that it's really important for people to have different ways of thinking about things. Uh, David Little, uh, in the, his opening uh, remarks at the opening session, uh, among other things, critiqued two of, well, three of the major in intellectuals in church state in this area in the United States who have uh, taken, in a way, from my perspective, fairly harsh and critical uh, approaches to religious freedom. But you need to know that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work on getting the third. We've had both, uh, but we've had two of them here, one in this conference and one in another conference because we really believe it's important to hear and to try and understand and to learn more about what other people are thinking. And, and sometimes as you do that, and I think this was part of the gravamen of David's argument, that uh, if you look closely at the argument, they're not so far away as they sound on the surface. And sometimes if you're engaged in sort of media combat, the kind of thing that uh, Rosalind Hackett talked about so, to some extent this morning, it's very hard to sort of get behind things and start finding what are the things that are possible uh, to address and to live with uh, together. Now I'm gonna just take a, a few minutes to talk about something that's going on in the background. Some of you are aware of this, uh, many of you may not, may not be. Uh, many of you have re may have received emails from one of our former students who's formed an organization called Free BYU. Uh, and that's part of the reason that Jürgen Smeyer didn't come. Uh, uh, Brigham Young University has a policy that to be a student here, you sign an honor code. And among other things, for those of you who, for those who are members of our church, uh, they're they commit themselves to live by the teachings of the church and so forth. And what you have to understand in the background of this particular policy uh, is, uh, number one, the fact that we can only serve, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like 5% of the relevant age cohort in the Mormon church at this, uh, at this university. Uh, it's now about as difficult to get in as it is to get into an Ivy League school. It's a little easier, but it's very competitive. Uh, there are families who have paid, who came here themselves, they're alumni, they've paid their tithing all their lives. Two thirds of the budget of the university is paid by tithing dollars that are contributed by church members around the world. And there's been a sense that the that the people who get the privilege of coming here should be people who are uh, living, living their religion. The, the tithing funds, you need to understand, go in, and there is a committee on disposition of the tithes, that's the, and the people who sit on that committee are the First Presidency and the Twelve Apostles. And those of us who are in the Mormon faith tradition believe that they guide those dispositions by inspiration and revelation. And one of the things that they've asked is that people who come here uh, abide by the standards. Now, we, we have a, a percentage, about 5% of the uh, students here are not LDS. They do not have to uh, be LDS. They can, and they sign a, a slightly different uh, honor code. Uh, but anyone who comes, before they come, specifically sign an, the honor code saying that they will live by these standards and they understand that there will be consequences if they don't. Uh, more than that, they typically have an interview with, uh, and Silvio's not reacting to this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he does have the other appointment on campus. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm describing this with some seriousness because uh, one, one of our former law students uh, uh, has taken upon himself to f form an organization critiquing uh, this policy. Uh, I was just going to say everyone who comes not only signs a specific document saying that they, will li that they agree to this, but they meet with uh, a bishop if they're a Mormon, or with an ecclesiastical leader if they're some other faith tradition. So this is a really a this is really taken seriously. Uh, so 
but in the last few days, uh, now I have to tell you, I met with this student. Uh, he's, now a, he's now a graduate. Uh, and uh, I heard by rumor, sort of by some other people, that his conversation with me, he found one of the more reasonable ones, apparently not reasonable enough because I didn't persuade him. He's still uh, working uh, to uh, try and uh, embarrass the university that they have this, this policy. Uh, and I think he... I think one of the things that I believe about religious freedom is that religious bodies, churches themselves, and re religious institutions have certain autonomy rights to govern themselves. Now, people can disagree about this. I mean, this is the kind of thing that people would disagree about. But I'm, I'm talking about this because it's, it's been close to home and I've sort of disrupted my thinking because it's been going on in the background while this is, while this conference is going on. I don't know if we've uh, handled things uh, totally correctly. I think we've tried to be uh, open. And uh, frankly, saying something here is an effort to be open. Uh, I think it's profoundly significant that we protect the autonomy, the religious rights of individuals uh, and the religious rights of institutions. And I think one of the things I would say is that it's important to understand the importance of having different institutions. Uh, institutions are really the seedbeds of pluralism. Without institutional bases, there are a lot of aspects of pluralism that wouldn't come about. Part of what Silvio was talking about, about the need for pluralism, uh, is in fact translated into practical reality a need for different kinds of institutions. Sometimes I have the sense that uh, superficial pluralists are all for pluralism so long as you will be pluralistic in exactly the same way that they want to be pluralistic. Uh, and, and, and yet one of the things I've learned from 40 years teaching here is that it, it it's important to have some places that are distinctive. Uh, it's important that we have the other state institutions that any of the students who, frankly, any student who can get in here is gonna have no trouble getting into state institutions in any state in this country. Uh, so that they can, they, there's, they can choose and sometimes people come here, some people, you know, people go through changes of religious belief. This can be uh, disruptive, it can be painful, but, uh, and we should be sensitive and respectful of those changes. Uh, but somehow they also need to be respectful and of, of the nature of institutions because an institution is not the same institution if you have it, if you're not sensitive to the sort of the unique needs of, of the institution. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to say, go into too much uh, I don't think I need to say more. Uh, as I say, people can, I, I am very committed to religious autonomy. I'm very committed to accommodation. I have some friends, indeed, here at this institution who <coughs> see things differently, and we have a marvelous uh, time sort of coming down slightly. Uh, I often say we're on very close to each other, just on different sides of the continental divide. Uh, and and that's that's healthy and and it's important it's important to be able to listen. I try not to tell my students that I've actually done some practical things that they could actually do making a living. Uh, I pride myself on being sort of based in legal philosophy and in the early days we had a Horizon course requirement to help broaden law students. And with respect to the Horizon, I was known as the outer space man. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but one of the things I had opportunity through much of the 80s and 90s to do was work on economic development. People don't realize when you're in third world countries that we need economic development here. Uh, and that led me to go to hearings and I learned some profound things going to hearings, and it's similar to what one learns coming to a place, to a conference like this. 
that if you listen to other people, you will hear things that will, and if you really listen, I mean, sometimes people have sham hearings and they do it, they go through the forms, but if you really listen, you come out with social uh, institutions and arrangements that are better than could be had if you hadn't listened. And I, I think that's one of the really critical things that, that in a way we're doing here. This is a very high level kind of listening because we listen to some of the most uh, sophisticated leaders working on law and religion issues around the world. Uh, we know that none of our countries are perfect. We know that we all need to find different and better ways to, uh, to, to live together. Uh, but that comes from listening carefully. And I'm convinced as we have more and more sophisticated thinking about the issues, we will find better ways, better solutions than we could find in any other way. I think for me, uh, one of the memorable moments that's been picked up on by one of the people sp uh, speaking was the, the, the question uh, from Nabil Fayyad, our Syrian colleague, who asked the question that uh, ultimately, I, this is, I'm, I don't, didn't have exact notes and I'm not gonna have this right. And besides, it was a long question that he sort of shortened at the end. <laughs> a uh, little prodding from Cliff Wallace. Uh, but in the end, it was a question about how do we get some of these principles that we're talking about in some countries where they're not very readily available. And uh, we had the very powerful response from Judge Moheng Moheng uh, to the effect that uh, you know, it, it depends on really uh, finding how much it's worth in your country. Now, I knew something about Nabil, who is someone whose home is uh, sh shattered with bullet shells and who is, uh, you know, one of these people who puts his life on the line in various ways for some of these uh, principles. Uh, so, uh, but 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 there was something about that exchange that I think reminded all of us uh, what it takes. We were we had the sense that we were listening to someone who had come through apartheid, and we knew something of the power of the apartheid regime and what it's meant to break past that. Uh, and. Uh, and I think when we see that kind of that kind of thing, I, I think most of us are really humbled by by the people who have known what it is to really put everything on the line for some of these principles. Now, fortunately, in most of our countries, we don't have to put our lives on the line. I have to say, I've been in enough experience situations that I've learned something about the people who have put their lives on the line or their professional careers or other comfort. I have a very comfortable life here. I have friend, faculty, colleagues that really support me even though I'm gone, no doubt, too much. Uh, but some of you take uh, significant risks with your lives, your professions. Uh, but in any event, have uh, committed in sufficient, significant ways to work on these uh, principles. Uh, I, I, th I think that uh, it's worth taking some time while you're here. One of the reasons we do the little survey form is there's something about writing down some things you're going to do we all get guidance in different ways as to things that we can do. But I can tell you over the course of 20 years, there are very few people who have gone away and haven't done something significant for their countries and their people. And we hope that will be true for you as well. Uh, as I listen to, 
I had maybe even more of Silvio's dilemma of do you listen or do you pre I, I definitely didn't even think about trying to prepare something in advance and uh, I've tried I've tried to listen um, I, I think it is significant. One of the things I will come away with is uh, stability is not stasis. Uh, stability needs to be open. This is one of the mysteries of modernity that uh, the true stability in government comes from openness, from listening to other people, from respecting other people, and that as people feel respected and safe, they have other kinds of energies freed up that can be powerfully productive for the societies in which we live. Now, Silvio said the real question is what makes meaningful change possible? And as I understood it, he said, you can't really have that if you don't have multiple inputs if you don't have a pluralistic background, a, plural, a plurality of life visions, if you will. Uh, and I think we need to also ask ourselves, what makes just change possible? And I think, again, it means listening to uh, fundamental rights. And there are many, many fundamental rights. We're more, we've got a richer constellation of rights in the modern international world than ever before. But of these rights, it's worth remembering that religious freedom was the oldest of the internationally recognized rights, was pretty thin and shaky when it was first enunciated. It meant things like, you were free to leave your country without being killed. <laughs> this was not a very robust notion of religious freedom. but. Uh, it gave birth to what we have come to know, and we've had, we've got much greater historical experience. And I'm convinced that, uh, that societies that don't have religious freedom in the last analysis are not just. And in a deep sense, without justice, uh, there is no lasting stability. So I hope that all of us uh, have opportunities to think harder about how we can make uh, contributions with respect to this, uh, what in the United States is often spoken of as our first freedom. Uh, I'm thankful to have been able to spend a lot of my life uh, working on this particular principle. It's a great one. It's worth, uh, it's, it's one of those things that is worth giving substantial uh, consecrated effort to. So let me conclude with that. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and thank you for what you have done and what you will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, and please proceed to the vans and to the hotel. We'll look forward to seeing you in just a short time at the hotel for dinner. <laughs>